Oh, hi. I got something to show you that I think you'll enjoy. You know, it's funny, we're, we're just getting these gardens going and it's gonna take a couple of years. Um, we have a history of gardening behind us, but not so much for veggies now, it's more for spices. And this one here is amazing. We think it's called Ezapote, and we think it's kind of the Mexican tarragon, as opposed to the French tarragon. You gotta get both of these plants. Mm. It's just wonderful. But the reason I even bring this stuff up, mm, that is just spectacular, is that even in this garden thing that we have decades of experience behind us, we have some great failures here and we have some new successes. And it's that way for all of us when we look into our genome and our labs and so on, it's not so much a criticism about us individually when we have a bad lab or a, geno a genome, a mutation that we're concerned about. These are things we can take care of. The reason I'm sort of going on in this particular um, theme is because I get a number of questions saying that I had that mutation that you have, or I had the mutation that you were talking about. Well, that doesn't mean your life is a catastrophe. Um, you know, 10 years ago, the big controversy was, oh my gosh, I have MTHFR. People would wonder what that is, but it sounded terrible, you know, and I mean, it can be a problem and it's, it is associated with a lot of bad outcomes, but it's because it was that problem of a mutation, which slowed that gene down, what it does, in a context of a very poor diet, of a very poor diet. If the diet improved, the vulnerability that was created by that mutation would be negligible. And so that's where genomics comes in. They are not a death sentence. They are not you struggling. It's this can be a problem in the context of a very poor diet. So let me show you some of our you know, victories here. This is just a wonderful plant. Tarragon's doing well. Our sage is, is, is fighting us. It's doing okay, but something's giving us some curly leaves. And we started this from seeds a couple of years ago. Our rosemary over here completely sucks. It did great for a couple of years and now it has this mold. Behind me is kind of my pride and joy. This is a two-year-old, a couple of plants back here. They're elderberries and we have another eight elderberries over there that are just one year old, ready to get started. This will be wonderful for so many different reasons. But the point is, this was easy to grow. It's going to be fruitful, this too. And yet, guess what? Tomatoes, which is something in New England where you could grow as much as you wanted to, we've had so much failures. I mean, we've had five plants die. And I guess these other two are probably going to go shortly. We have to figure out what we need to do here in a whole new area in Eastern Carolina. One thing will be, we actually have to shade it, give a partial shade. Never had to do that before. Bee bomb is wonderful. We're, we're, we're establishing a small forest here of basil, which is good. We have some basil over there and we have some, a whole nother bin of basil. Jalapenos, which are doing incredibly. We couldn't do jalapenos up in New England that well. Here it's almost like crabgrass. So you sort of take it for what it is and you figure out what you have to address. The point of today, I'm gonna to show you a little bit when we go inside, how you can learn some of this before. I'll show you the, the company I use, but guess what? You don't need a company. If you did 23andMe or Ancestry.com, you can download the raw data and you can go through your own raw data. It, it, clearly, it's very tedious, but you can do that. And I think the point that you get your hands on your own raw data, get your hands dirty and trying to understand this. That's the, the genomic part. That is also about the labs. I am so much adhered to the value of labs that we've talked about in various videos. Marry these two together, plus intracellular deficiencies, that's just a whole nother level, plus hormones, and you get a sense of how are you doing? And if you're doing fine, there's no reason to look into this, right? If you're doing fine, leave good enough alone, as they say, but when people either can't lose weight, keto's not working for them, there's reasons that that's the case. Keto does not work for everybody initially, but with some adaptation, checking these things out, it can work wonderfully. We'll get into some of the reasons why it is problematic for many of people and they're not losing weight, but it's easy to address and it put them back on track. So clearly dropping your carbs is a big deal. I'm a total believer in that. What else can I show you? Here's the remnant of our tomatoes that 
might make it this year. I don't know. It's, um, it, we use these tomatoes for the dehydrate for cooking sauces like barbecue sauce and so on and so forth. Um, we're, as I say, far less veggies or much more spices. So as we can check off successes, we can move on to the next one. As you check off your successes and understanding how you can address your own, not necessarily deficiencies, but that's a big part, to pull labs back to be healthier, it's a win and you move on. All right, so now I have to show you what's not working out. Meet, meet our two tomato plants that are doing poorly. They somehow got contaminated. We had to create this soil new this year, uh, whereas that's at least four years old and pretty well established. But certain things just don't do well. We got morning shade here. But look at this eggplant. This eggplant is doing fabulously. We'll probably have 20 to 30 eggplants, and yet that's something we've never been able to do before. It just changes as you change. Change your diet, things change. Change your location, things change. What else can I show you? Here's a rosemary plant that is just not doing well. We'll probably yank that out after, since it's been here a couple of years. By the way, rosemary branches, when you barbecue, throw them underneath, the smoke is just amazing. And as I've said before, here's our basil. Here's our orchard of elderberries. This is gonna be uh, quite a nice little orchard. So. Let's go inside and I'm going to show you how to use, get your raw data. You can use your raw data and that will be the beginning of understanding. Don't be overwhelmed. You know, this is what I consider a necessary part of you knowing you. If you have no problem, forget it. Move on. <laughs> you don't need to know what's going on. It's fascinating and it's very helpful to many. Okay, so this is about extracting information from your raw data. I'll show you what we use as a app, as they say, an online app that will use that data to give you a good report about yourself, okay? And there's plenty of companies that do this. Uh, we've worked with this one the longest, so I know this the best. It also, I believe, gives you the most information and also in terms of support than other companies do. So it's the price, it's the support, and it clearly it's the information. So let's get going, okay? So how do we do this? From We're using 23andMe, and I mentioned before that if I, you know, most people have already done 23andMe in the last 10 or 15 years. If you have not done anything like that, then I would suggest that you actually go to ancestry.com because they actually have more, slightly more information than does 23andMe at this point. Uh, what I know is the FDA has gotten involved with a lot of these companies to reduce the amount of information that's available to the public. And, and when I say public, it's your information to you. It's not like they're sharing it with everybody else. So um, there's a slight difference, and that's unfortunate. I downloaded mine about 10, maybe even 15 years ago, a while ago. So back then, the restriction wasn't so great. So I have, a, I believe, is a pretty good... Um, raw data file that I can forward to whatever company I want to. So that's the end of that. So if you haven't done this before, go to Ancestry.com. Uh, but I'm going to go with what I have, which is 23andMe for this example. Okay. All right. So you go to 23andMe and you, know, you can punch that into Google and you get to your site. This is me. That's my little picture. And what I do when I first want to, I, I can never remember how to download my raw data. So I go to this spyglass and I punch in raw data, then this pops up. And so what they'll do is, you know, you'll, you'll say, yes, I would like some raw data. They will then send you an email saying, are you the person that just asked for your raw data? You'll confirm that. Then you'll come back to this page and you'll hit this button and you'll download it. Pretty straightforward. What you'll get is a very large text file that will look exactly like this. Well, not exactly. You'll have different numbers on it. Okay. But it goes on and on and on. The RS is a, you know, it's a complete text file. It's a tab separated. Sometimes they're just out of line. You just pop them back in by tabbing it. So each line responds, it corresponds to a single SNP, single nuclear polymorphisms, which is what this whole thing's about. And the 
RSID is basically an internal system of identifying these particular mutations. And so one gene could have a number of different mutations. So what this is, here's the name, here's the number, the identifying number. And by the way, if you punch this into Google, just RS, boom, you'll get information on that particular mutation. Pretty interesting. It's pretty international at this point, uh, pretty ubiquitous. And this says what chromosome it's on. This is the position of that chromosome. And this is the actual uh, mutation. And what they say, the AA, these are all uh, nucleotides. So they have four kind of uh, nucleotides, which make up their nucleic acids, right? So this is the sequence. So say they, they identify this by AA. And once you get into this uh, mutation, you'll find out the one nucleotide should be there is swapped out for something that shouldn't be there. And what this is, is the one that ended up there. So this has the AA mistake, if you will. This also is homozygous. So AA is homozygous, GG, meaning it's the same on both chromosomes from mom and dad. And so all these, you get ones, eventually you'll find one that is not, oh, do I even find that? Uh, these are all homozygous, which is kind of funny, but you'll get one that is like CT or AG or whatever, and that's heterozygous. They have different mutations that you have on you, that came from, one came from mom and the other came from dad, okay? So those are nucleotides, four different ones. This is just all non-essential information, but this is only the thing that we're looking at, the identifying number. So now let's say you wanna find out, you, you, you looked up your mutations and so on, and you wanted to find out what you need to do. So you downloaded this particular file document, which is big, they won't, they won't choke your computer or anything, but uh, it's big. So you have two choices. One is you can go through it yourself and it's very tedious and you're going to be interested in how to do it, but you're going to go blind by the end of the hour uh, or you'll send it off to whatever company you want to send it off to. And there's plenty that will do this for you. Okay, so you have two choices. One is you can search through for a specific SNP yourself that you already know about. So you already have that number and you're going to put that number and I'm going to show you how to do this. Or you can upload it to one of many DNA companies that are going to generate a report from all that text file. It's kind of a nifty thing. And obviously the prices have come down over the years. And there's also other companies that will make their own tests. In other words, they will send you a kit that you have to either do a cheek a swab for, or you'll do a saliva tube. And uh, you have to be careful not to overdo the saliva or they'll send you another kit and it's too much. But that's how that's done. And they'll take four to six weeks and they'll generate their own particular report for you on their labs or wherever who they hired out to do the lab work for you. So it doesn't have to come from 23andMe and it doesn't have to come from Ancestry.com. So here's that text file. This is me, for instance. And what you should do to make this convenient is that if you're on a Mac and I'm on a Mac, hit the command key together with F. So command F, which is find. This will pop up at the top, okay? And what you can do, there's a little down arrow there. If you click on that, you'll see it says find word. If you don't click on that, it will. what it's going to do is going to find any of these RS numbers that have your sequence of numbers you're going to put in. I'll show you what I did. So I simply put in this mutation that I knew I already had. So I put in RS7946. This has to do with the PEMP gene, which we're going to talk about in a second, and then I've talked a lot about and in a lot of other videos. And this sort of lights it up and says, yes, you have it. You've been selected. So that's what that is. I put the number up there. It showed up down here, and sometimes you have to do it two or three times. It's it's kind of archaic, <laughs> kind of old-fashioned. Or you can send it off to, and this is strategy, and this is the company we use, and for what's going to cost you about $85, this is just hands down something that offers a lot of information. I feel free to go to all other companies, but I'm going to talk about this one because it's what we've used, and it's what I use for my clients. Okay, so you go here, you look at strategy, and you find them on Google, and it says, purchase a kit. You're gonna purchase a kit. And I just said it was $85, and it says it's $95. It's $85, because if you order it through a link I'll show you in our description to this video, you'll get a 10% discount. We don't get anything out of it. It's already so cheap. So they offered, they asked, do we want a, an affiliate or we want a discount for the people who do this? <laughs> we get like a dollar if we were to do it the other way, so give a discount. So they gave a 10% discount. That's pretty neat, but that's where you're gonna link you know, you're going to add it to cart. You're just going to buy one and you're going to, and then it's going to go through after you do that. It's going to say, this is how you upload your data. Pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go through that. All right. So there's a link 
to Stratagene in the description of all my videos and says where we get our genome SNP analysis done. There you go, you get a 10% discount. All right, so now you've done that, right? You got your report. Um, I can assume you had from Stratagene, let's say. But these are the three areas that I check into. So now I'm having you be on my shoulders and I'm gonna go through. I'm not gonna check every SNP. I look at three basic categories and related SNPs in those areas, which is problematic enough. So we'll look at that. So I'm gonna show you what I do. So three areas to be aware of. One all has to do with choline metabolism. That's become a big deal in the last five years, really. Folate metabolism, so folate as opposed to folic acid. And methionine cycle, otherwise, really has to do with B12 metabolism, okay? What you have here, and this is pretty much new information to see, you know, choline was just made a, by the NIH just called it a nutrient in 1998, so 24 years ago. And they still don't have a test, a serum test that doctors can use to measure choline. They basically do it by dietary uh, reference, you know, what have you eaten, so on and so forth. But anyways, choline, it used to be thought that, uh, and we're going to get into methylation, that folate and B12, MTHFR, and other things you might have heard of, have, were the dominant effectors, the dominant uh, influencers of how things went. But no, they find that now choline, uh, through a number of various forms of choline, I'm being kind of hyper simple, choline is something that's in your diet, is a balance to the folate B12, and it's absolutely necessary. This has more to do with neurotransmitters. Think of acetylcholine. This has more to do with choline-related methylation compounds like s adenylmethionine universal methyl donor, um, otherwise known as SAM or SAME. That's also a supplement, and I've done a number of videos on the effect of that on epigenetics that were done at Duke. Pretty fascinating. But I just want you to know it's choline, full AP12 are absolutely really important. So that's why we're looking at these three areas first. I'm breaking down, we're gonna pretend you got your report. This is actually my report. You got your report from Stratagene, and this is one of many diagrams they're gonna give you. And this is kind of the overarching one that they've really reduced the details that they have. So that's the folate cycle or folic acid cycle. Methionine cycle, think of methionine to homocysteine. And then the PEMT, I'm not going to tell you what that stands for. All right, so it's phosphatidylethylamine methyltransferase. Who cares? PEMT, PEMT, we're going to call it. And this is responsible for making acetylcholine in your body and responsible for getting acetylcholine started. So if this has a problem, you have a problem. I have that problem. So since this is me, I'm going to show you what these little genes mean. Why is that purple? Why is that yellow? Why is that orange? Okay, so we'll have a brief understanding. There's glutathione, which you've heard about. So these are very interrelated, really looking under the hood. And I don't want you to be scared off. Yeah, it's like, oh, look at all this stuff. You just like, he drowned me. I asked for a cup of water and he took me to the ocean and said, drink. Uh, it's not quite that extreme. And I'm gonna give you a handle on it. Okay, so here's how to read the diagrams. One is, these are just about the genes. So if you see purple, that means slow, right? Slow, slow, purple, slow. And if you see orange, that means fast. We're just thinking about purple or orange, fast and slow. In the, in the middle, intermediate, which is gonna be nothing, is yellow. We're going to ignore these other ones. That means, you know, if we don't see these two slow or fast, we don't have a problem, okay? All right, what are these other things? Well, now we're gonna talk about cofactors, all the other things that, are, that influence this particular gene. You know, the, the things in orange, make it go fast, tur, right? Increase its activity. And the ones in purple make it go uh, slow, or decrease its activity. There again, we're at purple and orange. Here we go, what does it look like? These are the choline associated in this corner for the most part. These are folate and B12 really is, you can see there's B12 there, but B12 needs to be methylated. You know, methylated folate needs to meet B12 to go on to reduce homocysteine. There's your inside secret. You can come back to this to look at all those other things, like here's how alcohol affects your other genes and so on. I wouldn't get wrapped up in it. I'm just trying to give you an understanding. My coverage about finding your most problematic, troublesome genetic SNPs will continue over in part two. It will be released tomorrow, just as soon as we're finished editing it. See you there. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it. 
various topics as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.